Hello, School District of Philadelphia, parents and guardians. I hope you and your families are staying safe and feeling well. I am so excited to welcome you to the district's virtual family academy, Learn Where You Live, a series of virtual workshops to help our families navigate this challenging moment in time. In our new learning at home environment, it is especially important to provide you with the necessary tools and resources to support your students academically, socially, and emotionally. By providing you with direct access to experts from across the school district, we look forward to interacting with you and having meaningful discussions. So sit back, enjoy, and let the hashtag Learn Where You Live live experience begin. Hello, families. Welcome to our latest version of FACT Virtual Academy. My name is Philip Hammond. I'm an assistant director and the Family and Community Engagement Office. Um, welcome and thank you for being with us today. Um, before we get started, I'll just run through some uh, webinar norms. Um, we will have the chat box available um, throughout the session. You can ask questions. Um, we ask that you do that. Um, uh, and we'll answer all the questions at the end. Um, we ask that we use the chat box because audio and video will be muted by the host just to respect privacy of everyone in attendance. Um, any follow-up questions can be sent to ask at phillasd.org. Um, this, this webinar and all future webinars can be found on our website at www.phillasd.org forward slash face forward slash fact. And just for everyone's, uh, just so everyone knows that this webinar is being recorded um, again so that we can post it for um, future viewing. So today's session is the Student Code of Conduct, the Parent Edition, brought to you by the Office of Student Rights and Responsibilities. And our presenter today will be Ms. Rosa Parks. Rosa, thank you for being here with us today. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am glad to be here today um, to talk to you guys a little bit about the Code of Conduct and how it is used um, in the virtual setting. Okay. Sorry. All right. So, um, as I said, I am um, Rosa Parks Green. I work in the Office of Student Rights and Responsibilities. Um, and so, today, what we're going to do is um, to go over a very high level overview of our most recent code of conduct for the 2020 2021 school year um, and how it applies to uh, digital learning. Um, and so, we know that this is very new um, for everyone doing work in the um, virtual world. And so, we want to make sure that um, you as parents have information you need about expectations that we have for our students um, during this time. Um, and so, I will um, begin by saying, like I said, this is a very high level overview of the co Code of Conduct. Um, our entire Code of Conduct can be found in its entirety on our website, um, on the Office of Student Rights and Responsibilities page. I would encourage you um, to take a look at it. It's a very long document. Document, um, which is why today we're only going to do a high level overview, but it is a very helpful resource um, and provides you with all the tools necessary to really be able to um, understand um, roles, responsibilities for all school community members. So the purpose of today's training, um, as I said, is to provide um, a high level overview of the important aspects of our code of conduct. Um, and so we'll have an opportunity to um, review that, as well as to learn how to apply the code of conduct um, during virtual learning. Um, and as I said before, this is very new, so we want to make sure that you all um, are fully equipped with the tools that you need to support um, students at home. So um, to begin, I think it'll be helpful if we start by talking about the purpose of our code of conduct. Why do we have our code of conduct? Um, so one of the reasons is to support a safe learning environment for all school community members. Um, and so we feel that it's very important that our students, um, staff, and all community members are safe 
during their time of learning. And so it sets clear guidelines and rules um, that should be applied during this time in order to promote a safe learning environment. Um, the purpose is also to provide clear and explicit expectations um, for behaviors in all school settings. So the code of conduct talks about everything from, um, you know, the dress code policy to, um, you know, consequences for disruptive behavior. Um, and so it's very clear as to what constitutes disruptive behavior, what happens if a student does violate our code of conduct, um, and resources and tools that schools and parents can use um, to support in modifying a child's behavior if it is disruptive. Um, so as I said, there's a lot of um, rules and expectations in there, even at the very beginning, I'm talking about roles and responsibilities. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those. Additionally, to provide administrators um, with interventions that address the student's disruptive behavior. So there's an entire section of some alternatives to um, like suspensions or disciplinary transfers. Um, and schools can use that um, as a means to support students who may have some issue or concern with their behavior. Um, and lastly, the Code of Conduct establishes policies, rules, and expectations for all school community members to learn, teach, and work together. Um, and as I said before, this is not just for students. This is for all school community members, including you parents. Um, so it is important that you take a look um, and listen in to some of the information that we have as far um, as that is concerned. All right, so when does the Code of Conduct apply? So for most people, you would probably um, think that the code of conduct applies when a student is in school participating in school sponsored events, which is absolutely correct. Um, so if there's an incident that happens in the school, um, for example, if there is some sort of um, disagreement or maybe bullying um, of some sort that happens in the school building, clearly our code of conduct applies and the schools would um, act accordingly. Um, the other time uh, the code of conduct applies is why students are traveling to and from school, and that could be any means. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that they're on a school um, a school bus. It could mean that they're also um, taking SEPTA, walking home, um, any means by which they're getting to and from school. And when we say the code of conduct applies in those instances, what we mean is that if, for example, there is some sort of um, group assault that happens um, as students are, um, you know, walking home from school, um, the school should be notified of the incident and then they would also have an obligation to look into it and investigate um, because that is happening with, the ch uh, with students who are going to and from school. Now, the last instance when the code applies um, could be a little confusing, but I'm going to try to break it down for you. So it's when um, there is some sort of off ground or after hours behavior um, that is has some connection to the school and the learning environment. Um, and the school climate is disrupted as a result. And so what that means is, is that if there is um, an incident that happens, let's say over the weekend um, in the community, however, um, the students that are involved are in the same class or in the same grade and have lunch together or some other um, class like gym together, um, and it's a disruption to the school climate. Um, so, for example, if there is some sort of altercation that happens on the weekend um, between individuals that, um, you know, may have interaction with each other in the school building or um, maybe in different friend groups that are, you know, having a contentious relationship, that affects the school climate um, because now it's disrupted and there's, um, you know, tension um, and there could lead to other arguments that are in the school building. And so as a result, schools, um, have the responsibility to investigate things that affect their school community um, and make sure that they're resolving it appropriately. Um, so if there is an incident, let's say for example, that involves one student um, from one high school and then another student from another high school um, and there's some sort of mutual fight that happens over the weekend, um, it likely will not affect the school community because they go to two different schools and it was a one-on-one -on -one incident. Um, so something like that would not necessarily be investigated by um, and uh, investigated and documented by the school because it doesn't necessarily have a connection to the school community. So now we're going to transition and talk about some general expectations. Um, so our code of conduct um, clearly lays out um, several expectations as it pertains to um, student staff and um, students, staff, um, and school community members or parents like you. 
Um, but we wanted to highlight today for you all some expectations that specifically focus on um, us being in the virtual world, okay? And so we encourage parents and guardians um, to review responsible and safe uses of technology with their children. Okay, so um, we understand that the um, devices that you all have um, are loaned um, and provided by the school district. Um, so we want to make sure that students are using it in a safe way and an appropriate way, right? Um, because it is used or the purpose, the sole purpose is to use it for learning. Um, and so um, it should be used for just for that um and not for maybe other things that um could you know bring in viruses into the device um and are not responsible looking at websites or other things that um did not have to do with um learning um additionally we want to um identify um uh, security or, or is there any safety problems um with the computer or the educational platform that the student is using that you notify the school um and so um we do understand that, you know, with technology, some, some things are out of your control. So if there is believed to be some sort of virus or the computer is not functioning properly um, or uh, something of that nature that you notify the school so they can take appropriate action to either get you a new device or fix the one you currently have. Um, so parents should also ensure that students can participate in digital learning in a space that is conducive for learning and success. Um, and so we know that this is very new for everyone um, as far as doing schoolwork in the virtual world. Um, but we want to make sure that we are conscious in regards to um, making sure that the student has, you know, maybe a room designated um, that they can sit in, um, that, you know, the noise level might not be as loud, um, and they have somewhere to sit and be able to engage um, in their learning um, through uh, through digital learning. Um, so we just wanna be mindful of that, that the environment in this space is one where they can really learn and be successful. And then lastly, once back in school, um, of course we're not in school right now, but the plan is to return to school buildings, that everyone is adhering to all social distancing guidelines as directed, um, which includes, but may not be limited to wearing a face mask. Um, so, as I said, this would only applies if you, um, once we get back into the school building, but there may be some guidelines that are put in place and we ask that all school community members abide by whatever those recommendations are. Okay, so, um, responsibility for students. Um, and as I said, and I'll reiterate this throughout the presentation, this is also outlined in, our enti in its entirety in our code of conduct. Um, but during digital learning, um, we want to um, kind of highlight some responsibilities for our students. Um, and one of which is respect all school community members, okay? And so we know that in the digital space, um, you know, you're logged on as a student, um, but we wanna make sure that we're following um, what the expectations are in the, in the classroom. So um, if the teacher is asking students to unmute themselves for whatever the reason may be and participate, um, not you know speaking out of term or calling um, other students' names. Um, these are just some of the, the behaviors that we've seen. We wanna make sure that we're respecting all school community members, um, including the teacher um, when we're in the digital space. Um, also want to understand and comply with the school rules and expectations. Um, so uh, in addition to our code of conduct, a lot of schools have their own rules and expectations that they have of students. Um, and so students uh, should have been apprised of that very early on about what the expectation is for their particular classroom or their particular school. Um, we want to make sure that students behave in a manner that focuses on academic success, okay? And so um, one of the, um, you know, concerns is in, you know, the digital space is that the teacher is not right there in the setting with the student, okay? And so it's sometimes maybe difficult for them to control what's going on at a, a student's home, okay? And so that's where you parents come in, where you can um, help us out um, to make sure that students are focused on um, being successful in the classroom, that their behavior is appropriate for the classroom um, while in the digital learning space. 
Um, and lastly, protecting passwords um, and any inform login information that is given to the student for school. Um, and so we have seen some um, behaviors where students are giving out um, their login information to other um, students who do not belong in those classrooms or even those schools. And so it's important that they keep that information um, confidential. It's provided to them to promote their academic success and for them to log into the classroom and shouldn't be shared with other, other individuals um, who do not belong in those classrooms. So dress code and expectations. Um, so during the digital learning, students are not expected to necessarily wear their school uniform that has been designated for their school. However, we do ask that students um, and expect that students are fully and appropriately dressed for class during digital learning. Okay, so um, you know when we say fully dressed, fully clothed clothes on, um, as well as being appropriate as well and being mindful that um, we are still, pardon me, we're still in a school setting. Um, students should also be mindful that the clothing that they wear um, is visible to everyone in the classroom. Um, it could be considered offensive um, or could violate our harassment policy. So it's important that um, students are aware um, that what they have on should be appropriate um, for online class. As well as um, students who, um, or students who have the right to um, dress according to their stated gender identity or expression. Um, and that is within the constraints of the school's dress code policy. So if we're in the school building, right, the student has the ability to dress in accordance with their stated gender identity. And that also too applies in a digital learning space as well. Okay. But um, I know that it does talk about the dress code. So that's only when we're talking about being in the school building. All right, so here's just some information that I think is very helpful to share about certain gray bands and what is permissible and what is not permissible. All right, so as a district, our district policy is that we do not suspend students who are in grades kindergarten through two, second grade, um, unless there's some sort of serious bodily injury. Um, so serious bodily injury, uh, what we would define as something that requires medical attention um, and is very severe. Um, and students who do display disruptive behavior and are in grades K to two, um, the schools are working with the counselor um, to really help support that student um, in modifying their behavior. So I know sometimes questions come up from parents about why, you know, they did not suspend a first grader or a second grader for their behaviors. Um, and the reason is, is because suspensions, the data show, does not change behavior. Um, and so we want to use interventions that will hopefully help to modify students' behavior, um, especially in grades K to two. We also think it's very important that these students, because they're so young, are in the classroom. Um, and so we're trying to find other alternatives or mechanisms uh, to support and modifying their behavior. However, there is a very, as I said, limited, limited exception if there is some sort of serious bodily injury. Um, so the second point is, is that um, students who are in grades kindergarten to five who are exhibiting some sort of pattern of disruptive behavior or committing some sort of serious violation do not receive disciplinary transfers. Um, and that is a state regulation, um, not a district policy. Um, so the difference, the district policy is something that the district has decided to do or agreed to do. Um, however, the, the regulation about students who um, uh, are in grades kindergarten through five is mandated by the state. Okay, and so we are not permitted to uh, do, use disciplinary transfers uh, for students um, who are in grades kindergarten to five. Um, so with that being said, um, students in grades three to five potentially could be suspended, um, but not receive a disciplinary transfer um, in any way. So. All right, so students who engage in behaviors um, that do endanger or disrupt the school um, the educational experience could potentially be subject to um, 
consequences according to our code of conduct. And so our code of conduct does very clearly outline in our behavior matrix, a list of all of the violations that a student could potentially, um, or a consequence, I mean, I'm sorry, a list of the code violations yeah, that a student could potentially um, violate. And so um, they're, they're all listed on there. And then on the grid is also very clearly defined what level of consequence could be applied to that specific behavior. So some things schools are only allowed to do in in-school in, um, intervention. Some uh, offenses, schools are allowed to just suspend in in-school interventions. And then some may go all the way potentially to expulsion. Okay, but it's important to note that, um, you know, that this does exist and it very clearly outlines what are some of the behaviors um, that could be, um, that the schools could document as um, resulting in some sort of consequence. Um, of course, though, we are encouraging schools, especially during this time of distant learning, to use in-school interventions. Um, and uh, making sure that they are done um, and implemented to address the inappropriate behavior. Um, and sometimes there may be a need for um, some sort of consequence, uh, which could potentially be a suspension or disciplinary transfer. However, our hope is that during this time of di digital learning that schools are really using the interventions because our goal is to keep children in the classroom um, engaged in learning as best as possible. Um, lastly, is that out of school suspension should be used as a last resort. And this is what we've always been telling schools. Um, and, you know, we think that is important because, as I said, we want to keep children um, in the classroom. But we do understand that there are some behaviors that may rise to the level of a suspension, um, you know, for whatever the reason may be. But we are encouraging schools to use some other interventions um, as outlined in our code of conduct. <clears throat> um, during digital learning, um, schools still have an obligation to investigate any incidents that are brought to their attention um, and document them as office discipline referrals. And so I think it's important that students know as well as parents that um, just because a student is, you know, not physically in the building, a code of conduct still applies. Schools still do have a responsibility to investigate um, anything that is brought to their attention. And these, as the list here that's on the screen, are some of the offenses, not all, but some of the offenses that are included in our behavior grid that could um, rise to the level of the school needing to investigate and take proper action. Um, so the first one is inappropriate use of electronic device. Um, and that includes um, the Chromebook that is provided to the student, as well as it could be their actual personal cell phone that could um, as well be um, inappropriately used. So we see a lot of students maybe bullying on social media um, or maybe not using the Chromebook the way that it should be for learning. Um, another um, um, violation could be harassment. Um, so students, even in the digital space, um, harassing other students in their classroom. Um, destruction of property, um, and that also includes district property, uh, which would include the Chromebook, um, is not permitted um, and could be documented as an office discipline referral. And lastly, um, photographing or recording other students um, during class sessions. Um, and so um, that never was permissible and still is not permissible even um, in the digital setting. Um, and if there are individuals who are recording or taking pictures, they must have the consent of the individuals who um, they are recording in order to do so. So um, now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that you can do as a parent to help support um, your children at home with maybe some disruptive behaviors. Um, and so um, our code of conduct does have more detail um, about these. I'm just gonna talk about this um, kind of just as an overview. Um, but I would encourage you to take a look um, and also check out our website as well through the Office of Climate and Safety, which has um, additional information that could be supportive. Um, so as I stated, the schools, there is, um, 
three pages in our code of conduct that clearly outline for school some of the the resources and the things that they can do to help students with disrupt disruptive behavior. And so what I'm gonna talk about now is some of the things that you can do as a parent to help your children if there are some disruptive behaviors. Um, so the first thing is called Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports. Um, this is a program also known as PBIS, which is um, a part of um, many of our schools. Um, some of our schools just use the technique, um, but some of our schools actually have the formalized program in the school building. And it's a really effective way um, to build um, a child's social, emotional, and behavior skills um, to reduce um, difficult behaviors um, that the student may be having. Um, and so, there, um, the next slide here is just going over some um, examples of ways that you can enforce positive behavior um, and also reward students for displaying positive behavior even in the virtual classroom, um, during mealtime in the home, as well as at bedtime potentially. Um, and so um, the screen here talks about three different areas about um, students being respectful, responsible, and also being safe. Okay. Um, and so I'm just going to read a couple of them. Um, so in regards to the virtual classroom, keeping the noise to a minimum um, to promote academic success for all students, um, as well as, um, you know, uh, being responsible as well, um, doing the best to turning your work on time. Um, during meal times, um, being kind to the individuals um, that are in the household. Um, washing and cleaning your hands. Um, that's being responsible, especially given this time that we're in. Um, as well as during bedtime. So being responsible, going to bed on time, okay. Um, and also being um, polite and doing the things that you need to do to prepare for bed. Um, so these are some of the aspects and ways that you can help um, your children to um, be respectful, responsible, and safe, and reward them um, with praise, even something as simple as praise, if they're doing the right thing. Um, so that's a way that you can promote their positive behavior, um, even in the home. The other um, huge um, way that we as a district um, support students with modifying their behavior is through restorative justice, also known as RJ. Um, and this is a set of principles and practices used to build community um, and respond to harm or conflict and provide circles of support um, for students um, in which they can share and have a conversation. Um, <clears throat> so the purpose is um, to be able to build and maintain um, and then restore relationships. That's very key here um, between members and of entire school community. And this is done um, by having circles or conversations um, as well as um, this is a means by which this could be some sort of alternative to a suspension or some sort of punitive discipline. Okay, so the next slide I'm going to talk about um, some examples of restorative justice even at home. Um, so in the school building, um, you know, there would be, um, you know, a circle or a discussion, a conversation with a group um, about, you know, harm and healing. Um, but if you are at home with your child, you can also ask these questions to kind of get at um, what happened and how you can move on um, and restore uh, the relationship to back to where it was. But some of the questions you can ask are, why is it, um, what's important to you today? Okay, you know, what um, is important in regards to having this discussion? Um, what happened? Um, so you can get all the information about what happened um, with that particular incident. And then what do you need to move forward? And that's really important for um, the restorative conversation because we want students to be healed as a result of the conversation. Um, and then based on that, um, you know, having a discussion about what you'd be willing to agree to, you know, what, what would you agree to move forward, whether that is an apology, um, whether that is, um, you know, um, an open discussion with the other party or student involved in the incident. 
Um, how are you feeling now um, that you've had an opportunity to talk, you know, in a discussion? Um, and has there been any agreements reached, right? So, um, you know, are you all able to agree that you, you know, are going to keep your distance and not say anything offensive to each other? Has there been an agreement between the parties? Um, as well as if there's anything else that you want to say. Um, sometimes there may be an aspect of um, a student wanting to get something off their chest and, you know, last, you know, final words, or maybe just something as simple as an apology. Um, so that's important too when we talk about um, harm and healing. Okay. So these are some, just some of the questions that you could ask and support, um, you know, at home with some sort of restorative conversation um, with the student. Um, and like I said, there's also more information on this um, on our website. So students um, who do receive some sort of disciplinary action. Um, so that means that um, the school has investigated um, the incident and then there is some sort of um, consequence um, like a suspension or a disciplinary transfer. Um, so the student will have um, an opportunity um, and will be given an opportunity to respond to those allegations and that with their version of the events. Um, so the school should ask the student what happened, maybe ask them to write a statement of some sort, um, but the student should have the opportunity to respond as to their version of the event. Um, students uh, should also know, and parents as well, that students don't have to write a statement. Um, we do encourage students to write a statement, but we don't force them to write a statement. And the reason why we encourage them is because we want to hear their side of the story. And if all we have is information from maybe other witnesses or maybe the victim, we don't really have a clear picture because we haven't heard from the student who's being accused of the disruptive behavior. So as I said, we do encourage it, but we do not force students to write a statement if they do not want to. Um, then the behavior, um, the disruptive behavior or the problematic behavior is discussed and what ways it can be corrected. Um, so some sort of discussion with the parent, you know, a phone call, a meeting um, to say, you know, this is what happened and this is what our next steps are. Um, and the school should provide that to you. Um, and um, also inform you, the student and the parent, um, about what corrective action or next steps will be taken. And then as I said at the beginning, um, disruptive behaviors will be documented in our student information system by means of an office discipline referral. Um, and so um, that is still even happening in the digital world. Um, so that will be documented and whatever the resolution is um, or the next steps are that will be also documented in um, the office discipline referral. So in very limited circumstances during digital learning, we are still conducting disciplinary hearings. Um, and I think it's important for students to know that, um, you know, we would hope that students would be focused on, you know, academic success um, and, and learning and during this time, um, especially as it's so hard to engage in a, in a digital setting. But there are some dis behaviors that um, are so egregious that would rise to the level of a disciplinary hearing. And so it's important that I explain to you all what that would look like in a digital setting. Um, so in any setting, whether it's digital or in person, um, an administrator will be at the hearing. Okay. Um, all hearings are recorded, and that is not anything that's new. They've always been recorded, um, even prior to us being um, digital, um, so that we have a record that the hearing did occur. Students have the right to speak, and once again, similar to the statements, we encourage students to speak so we can hear their version of the story. Um, hear how it affected them, you know, hear, ask them questions about, um, you know, what have they thought about since this incident? Uh, how, uh, you know, will you change anything now that this happened? How do you think people were affected, you know, by this incident? And so we ask these questions to really get a good understanding as to what happened and now what the student is thinking um, to see if they are in some sort of restorative mindset um, that they want to fix the behavior that they um, have done. 
Caregivers, um, parents and guardians will also have the opportunity to speak. Um, once again, we encourage them to speak as well because sometimes parents give us insight on, you know, things that we don't know just looking at, you know, a disciplinary file. So that's also very helpful to be able to provide that information. Um, parents can also request a copy. Um, you do have the right to do so, although parents are not allowed to record the hearings, you can have a copy of the hearing at the conclusion um, of the hearing. You just request it through the Office of Student Rights and Responsibilities. Um, decisions are not made at the hearing, so this is not a, um, a hearing where we have a judge of some sort. There is a hearing officer. Um, who facilitates a conversation between the school, the child, um, and, you know, really is able to make a decision after thinking about and going through all the information that's presented, um, which will happen after the hearing concludes. And as of right now, all hearings will be virtual. So the way that we do hearings um, is there is a link that is sent out to the school, the parent, um, and that is the way that we are doing hearings until, um, until the buildings are back open. So just quickly, um, in regards to our disciplinary hearings, there are, um, these are I'm listing for you, outcomes of um, disciplinary hearings. So the first outcome is that there was insufficient evidence, okay, and so, um, Insufficient evidence um, could mean that the school did not provide enough information to show that the student actually violated the code of conduct. Okay. So um, some schools have the responsibility to provide um, any information that they've gathered as a part of their investigation and present it to the hearing officer. If the hearing officer feels like they have not presented enough to show that that code of conduct violation as um, outlined and defined by our code of conduct was actually violated, then they can rule that there was insufficient evidence. The other um, insufficient evidence um, category could be that um, the student did violate the code of conduct, okay, however, it does not warrant um, and what we call level three, four, or five response. So a level three, four, or five response, if you look at our behavior matrix, would be for a student to receive um, a lateral transfer, a, um, a disciplinary transfer to a disciplinary school, um, or some sort of behavior contract remaining at the school. And the reason why we say that there's insufficient evidence to warrant these higher level um, responses is because whatever happened, whether there was a suspension, maybe there was a mediation, whatever happened, we feel was sufficient enough that no other further consequence would be warranted. The next um, potential outcome for a disciplinary hearing would be a behavior contract. Okay. And so a behavior contract um, would be used when the student does violate the code of conduct and the hearing officer does make that determination, but the student is going to remain at their school. Um, and so when we have a student who has violated the code of conduct but remains at their school, we implement a behavior contract, which is an agreement with the school and the student that the student will not um, engage in those disruptive behaviors anymore, that they will, um, you know, do other things, maybe like attend school daily, you know, not cut class, um, and really um, display exemplary behavior um, as a result of, of the hearing. Um, <clears throat> the next outcome is a lateral transfer. Um, so that means that the student would receive a school assignment through our um, Office of Student Enrollment and Placement to a school that is, um, to a different school, neighborhood school, that is close to the student's home. Um, so our office, we would make the decision about whether or not the student does get a lateral transfer and then student enrollment and placement would make that determination as to what school that would be. Um, you know, closest to the student's home that is different from the school that they are currently at. And lastly, an alternative education program. So we do have two alternative schools in Philadelphia. Um, both of them are called Camelot. Um, they are located, though, in two different um, areas of the city. Um, however, though, that is the alternative program um, that we have for the district.
So um, parents have the right to appeal certain decisions um, that are made by um, the school and also central office. So I think it's important that we just highlight these for you all. You can find more information in great detail about um, what each of these entail. Um, but some of the things that parents could appeal are disciplinary transfer. So if there is a hearing and this student um, does get assigned to a later, laterally to another school or even to a disciplinary school, that there is the ability to um, appeal that decision if you're not in agreement. Um, neighborhood school transfers. So that is if a student is um, asked to return back to their neighborhood school um, because maybe they provided an incorrect address um, to um, a particular school. And so parents have the right to a appeal that decision as well. Um, school selection. So if they're um, not if uh, back in, I mean, starting in October and November, there is the opportunity for parents and students to apply to schools outside of their neighborhood. And you can apply to up to five schools. However, if you do not get into any of those five schools, you have the ability to appeal that decision um, to see whether or not you could be selected or the student could be selected for a um, special admission school. Um, homeless designation. Um, so students who are experiencing homelessness have the ability and are afforded certain rights to attend um, schools that may be outside of their neighborhood catchment. Um, and so sometimes a student may not be deemed homeless um, according to what the law says and there's the ability to appeal that. Um, parent exclusion letters. So if there is an incident that happens in the school building that poses some sort of threat or harm to the school community, um, schools have the right to issue the parent an exclusion letter, which means that they are excluded from the school building unless by appointment, um, you know, with someone at the school, unless they have an appointment. So um, parents can appeal that decision as well. Um, if they deem that it was not done um, and made fairly or appropriately. Um, a bullying or harassment finding. Um, and so we as a district um, investigate and any issues or concerns with bullying and harassment. And so if there is a decision that is made and you as the parent are not in agreement with that, you can appeal that decision as well as an interim assignment. And an interim assignment means that there is a student whose behavior poses an immediate threat or harm to our school community to the point where they have to be immediately removed and put in a disciplinary school pending the outcome of their hearing. So we would have to wait until the hearing, but um, you know, given um, whatever the behavior is that poses some sort of imminent threat or harm, um, at that particular time, the student is immediately removed and placed in an alternative setting. And parents have the ability to um, uh, appeal that decision as well. Okay, and as I said, there's more information on our website about this, but I did want to give you at least an overview of these um, items that could be appealed and you have the right to do so as a parent. So reporting bullying and harassment, um, I think it's important that we do highlight this um, because we know that this um, at times poses an issue for our school community. Um, and so parents or any parents, staff, any school community member has the ability to report bullying and harassment um, and or discrimination and all these reports will be investigated. So there is an online form um, which can be used and it can be found on our website um, at fellasd.org um, slash bullying. Um, and um, there's also um, another um, means by which you can report um, bullying or harassment or actually any really incident um, that you feel um, should be investigated. Um, and this is called our Safe to Say hotline. Um, and the phone number is 215-400-SAFE or 7233. Um, this also is a means by which you could also report something anonymously if you, you know, thought that was appropriate. Um, we do think that it's helpful if you provide your information so that we can follow up with you. 
but if there is something, some sort of behavior or concern that you feel um, would uh, you would like to report anonymously for us, whatever the reason may be, you could do that um, via the safe to say hotline. And lastly, you could also tell an administrator <clears throat> in the school building or any school staff um, about the incident of bullying, harassment, or discrimination. Um, and the school still has a responsibility um, to investigate those um, allegations. Okay. Um, if your student, um, God forbid, is a victim, um, there are some, there is a resource for um, these students um, and victim services can be um, sought out through our, I'm sorry, it's not through ours, it's through the Pennsylvania Office of Safe School Advocates. Um, so this is not a district run um, program. This is a, a program that is run through the state um, and Safe School Advocates um, is a, a resource for students who have been victim um, in the school building. Uh, and so this is their phone number, 215-656-5381. Um, you can also reach them um, via email at ra-ossa philadelphia at pa.gov. And they also have a website here as well, which is www.philly, P-H-I-L-L-Y, O-S-S-A dot com. Um, and they can be a resource for um, you and your child if they're, um, if you, if they're, if the student has been a victim to some sort of incident in the school. All right, so this concludes um, the content portion of the training. Um, I will open it up at this time if there are any um, questions. Rosa, can we go back to the full screen? Oh, sure. Uh, like stop like this? Yeah. Yep, there you go. Okay. Thank you for that. Eunice, do we have a, do we have any questions in the chat? There are no questions in the chat. Nothing at the moment. All right. Um, so yeah, so as I said, you may or may not have any questions. Like I said, I would encourage folks to um, review our code of conduct um, on our website um, in its entirety. Um, like I said, it's a pretty lengthy document, but it's a very helpful resource. Um, so I would encourage you to take a look at that because um, it goes into more detail about um, the things that I talked about today. Well, thank you again, Rosa. Um, again, if you are interested in um, this, uh, reviewing this, uh, this webinar, you can see it at our website at uh, www.phillasd.org forward slash face forward slash fact. Um, did I see uh, something pop up in the chat? Oh, thank you. This is so oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Another thank you. All right. Um, well, thank you again, Rosa. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, be on the lookout uh, for our future sessions. Um, you can find those at uh, the same website below. That's www.phillasd.org forward slash face forward slash fact. Phil, and you, do, you do have one question that just popped up, my apologies. Um, it says, what does it mean when you, what does it mean when um, you say level three, four and five? Yeah, so a level, um, actually even taking a step back. So when we talk about the different levels of consequences um, in the code of conduct on um, our behavior matrix, there are different levels to consequences. So like the first level is that the school, um, pardon me, can only do an in-school intervention. That's the, the lowest level. And then the, the grid goes all the way to potentially expulsion. That means that the student would be removed for a period of time or indefinitely from the school district of Philadelphia. So when we say level three, four or five offenses, those um, would require, or those would warrant um, 
that there is some sort of disciplinary transfer. Okay, so um, uh, it, 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 the level, the I guess the name when we say level three, four, or five it might be somewhat confusing, but the behavior matrix does outline very clearly each level and what each level means. So. Um, when we say that there is insufficient evidence to warrant a level three, four, or five offense, we are saying that whatever the school did leading up to the hearing, um, whether that was a suspension or the student might have, um, you know, been enrolled in counseling or the student potentially could be involved with a program through um, Philadelphia Police Department, whatever happened leading up to that hearing was sufficient enough to the point where the student doesn't need to receive a lateral transfer or a disciplinary transfer to a disciplinary school because whatever happened was sufficient. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. It did. Okay, great. <laughs> Any other questions? At the moment, we can hang out a little bit. And if, uh, yeah, for sure. But um, thank you again, everyone. Um, take care and have a good day. You too.